All right, everybody. Today is all about memory. What memory does, what is memory, what does it kind of do, and how does it help us kind of function? Because, again, when people, a lot of people think of memory. They think in terms of remembering certain like facts and figures and what your mom told you to do yesterday. That is true. But at the same time, there's a lot more going on than just that. And memory does a lot of things to kind of help us kind of continue to function as a person, as an individual, as a human in a three-dimensional world that involves linear time and all that other good stuff. So with that, we'll just dive into it and go from there. And this right here is the three box information processing model. This is the model that we have to kind of show how memories are created. You have your sensory memory, you got your short-term memory, you got your long-term memory. And at every stage, from your sensory memory, with your short-term memory, long-term memory, memories are lost, information is lost, because it's not encoded enough. And all these things will actually go into it much more detail. But from but this is kind of what that model looks like. So first off, you got your sensory memory. This is your split second holding tank for all the incoming sensory information. So for example, um, all the information that is coming in is you know, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, how cold it is, all that other good stuff. All of this is coming in. And... It first comes here, and then this kind of does two things. And here's kind of where it starts to kind of branch off a little bit. Because you have your iconic memory, this is a split-second picture uh, memory. Think of it kind of like an old-timey film strip, where each little box, each little cell, has a kind of a different picture. And what it is, is that's kind of really what this is. You have a kind of split second image and then as you kind of roll that memory, you, as it comes in, because instead of like just watching it on a film, what's happening is these memories are actively being created. So that's your iconic memory. This is your visual thing. Then you have your auditory memory or your echoic memory. This is very this is brief it's not split second like your iconic but this is a brief three to four seconds of sound and what this enables you to do is pretty much understand the sentences that i'm saying while i say them because if you did not have your echoic memory what would happen would be all you would hear would be like a word all you would remember would be one particular word so the whole long sentences that I've been stringing out together, you would not you would not be able to follow along with what I was saying because if you did not have your echoic memory, complete with all the weird stutters and times I screw up saying stuff, words. From from there, the next thing that happens is you you encode things. Um. And really what happens is this. Information is transformed so the nervous system can understand what's going on. Now, back when we were looking at the uh, you know, the senses, the things you see, the things you hear, the things that you touch, it's broken down into electrical impulses. It goes in, you know, by your nervous system, shot to your brain, where it's all reassembled. Well, the next thing that happens is kind of this part. Because, okay, you have these things being created. You have the scenes. You have your perceptions being created. Well, the next thing is, well, what happens to them? Well, this is kind of the next thing. When you have your perceptions that are being created, whatever that may be, sitting in a classroom, being at work, driving down the road, where does this stuff go? Where do your memories go? If you ever really stop and think about it, where do your memories go? Where are they stored? 
this is something that actually computers have actually kind of helped us understand a little bit because you have your memory on a computer. Let's just run with a computer for now. You have your memory on a computer. The programs that you download are stored on the memory. You know, the, uh, the RAM, the motherboard, you know, your memory, whatever. Um, I forget the exact verbiage right now. But it's stored on your hard drive. All your programs, all your games, your homework, your all the little files that you have. It is stored somewhere on your computer. And then later, if you want to go back, you know, if I decide, you know, or later today I'm going to, uh, you know, start making battle or playing BattleTech again. I just open up the program, boom! I can march around with robots and blow up stuff. That's, in essence, a memory on my computer. Your memories may operate a lot like the same, a lot like the same way. Because you have, maybe, if the theory holds, even though it's more and more leaning to, yes, it might, it probably, this is probably real. In your neurons, you may have something, may have something called an engram. A memory engram. Now what these engrams do is, if they're right, they may actually physically store your memories. Whatever those memories may be. So like for example, you maybe have a neuron somewhere in your brain that has the engram that says that this is green. You may have another engram that says this is a highlighter. And you may have another memory that says that highlighter is closed, where the cap is on, or however you phrase it. And so in order to understand that here's my marker, or here's my highlighter, is green, open, close. You have all of those different kinds of memories stored in individual neurons inside of your nervous system that says what this is. That help you identify it, give, assign all the adjectives to it and everything else. That is in essence what is happening when you're encoding it. <clears throat> now, there's still more things to work out with the theories. Uh, with this engram theory, because there's a few things where they're trying to figure out, okay, do you have certain, um, like, short-term engrams with long-term engrams, which kind of go with the different kinds of memory. But that's something that they're still in the process of working out. But it is actually an interesting area of study if you want to study, you know, memory. Like, why you remember the things that you do and why you remember, why when you try to go to bed, you're like, oh, I need to remember to do that. And then you wake up the next day and you totally forgot the thing that you wanted to tell yourself to remember. So, you got, so, from your sensory memory, you have your working memory, sometimes called short, sometimes called short, blech, sometimes called short term memory, or short term memory, sometimes called working memory. Just depends on who you talk to. But here's kind of how it works uh, these are memories that we are working with or conscious of. And these are the things that we think. So, when you are thinking about something, when you're trying to solve a math equation or something, and you're trying to remember back to, you know, how to add or something, <laughs> you, um, you, you know, you bring this up from your long-term memory, which we'll get to later, but, um, but you'll bring these things up and you will kind of, they'll be there. Uh, this is temporary. These will fade after about 10 to 30 seconds. If they're not, or if we're not doing anything with them. Now, we can juggle around seven items. Uh, but the idea of multitasking, you know, people are like, well, I can multitask. No, you can't. Multitasking is a lie. Um, because what happens is this. And this is something that we kind of know because computers kind of give us this kind of information. Your computer or your cell phone or anything electronic, they actually only do one thing at a time. They just do one thing at a time very, 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 very fast. So when you're trying to focus on multiple things, 
what happens is your mind is operating a lot like the same way. It is splitting his attention, but what you're doing is you're splitting rather all of your attention between a lot of different things. So you work, you do this, 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 you do this. That's why when you're maybe trying to like, maybe when you're trying to like watch a TV show and fold your laundry at the same time while carrying on with a conversation, you're eventually you'll look at, you know, you're doing all that stuff and then you will look at the TV and be like, oh wait, what did I miss from the, what did I miss from the show? Well, I thought that person died. Um, that's kind of, you know, that's what happens. So there's also another little bit to this that this is also kind of the memory that we work with during the day. Uh, as you take in information, as it moves from your sensory memory to your short-term memory, things that uh, during your day will kind of habitate here as well. Um, and then what also happens too is we have things like rehearsal, you know, things that try to help us remember into, you know, longer, uh, longer term memory, which again, we'll get to, but, um, rehearsal works here. Repeat till you memorize. This is also where, um, you can expand on your working memory by using kind of like mnemonic devices. That's why like when you have your cell phone, you have your, uh, you got the hyphen in there. It's so that way you can actually chunk it. You can break it down into smaller pieces because again, one thing about our brains is our brains are again, energy misers. They consume so much of our energy that they try to find ways to not work. So they can kind of focus on other things. And what happens is if, you, if we did not, if you try to memorize your cell phone number and you did not have the hyphens to break it up, to break it up a little bit, your brain would be like, no, that's too hard. I'm not going to do it because again, our brains, because they already do so much already, they try to find ways to not be bothered with certain things. Seriously, cat, you just got to be seen in this or be heard in this. Stop it. Oh, my cat's got his little asthma attack thing going. And then you can also do other things like, you know, mnemonic devices. Roy G. Bibb for the colors of the rainbow. Uh, PIMDAS for math. Uh, King Henry David Many Dumb Crazy Maidens for the metric system. Um, those are just things, again, to kind of expand on our memory. Give us some hooks or some things to kind of hang things on to. And then, yeah, rehearsal, pretty much just repeat till you memorize it. I will not argue with idiots on YouTube. I will not argue with idiots on YouTube. I will not argue with idiots on YouTube. I should change that to, I will not argue with idiots on Facebook. Uh, people are stupid. Uh, <clears throat> so, you got your long-term memory from here. You, this is your permanent storage, mostly. Once it's here, it stays forever. Mostly. Now, the reason why I say this is, yeah, once you have a long-term memory, it'll probably stay there for a while. But over time, you will lose it. It's going to disappear, especially, especially if you don't use it. Uh, and again, if you've ever seen the, movie, seen the movie Inside Out, there was that one scene where you had joy and sadness. They were going through the... Uh, uh, the the memory, long-term memory storage. And there was those, um, uh, those mind workers that were like sucking out all the gray balls, spoiler alert, uh, sucking out all the gray memory balls that the human, the Riley character was no longer using. Like they just really weren't important, but they kept a certain, you know, they were keeping the certain ones that were, you know, important to the, to Riley, except for that one, the, you know, the, Triple dead gum will make you smile. That's was staying forever because A, long term memory. B, it's so catchy that it kind of stays with the, uh, with, with you. You know, it's those things that you, know, you repeat it enough times, it's going to stick with you no matter what. But, um, but they can decay and fade over time. Just like how you know, some of the marbles went gray because they weren't being used. Then they got. Uh, shot to the dump and um, until eventually they just faded away altogether. In essence, that's kind of what happens. 
uh, with our even with our long term memories, and the uh, eventually, and you know, one thing that's kind of uh, gut wrenching, sad, and very true for all of us was when Bing Bong died. When Bing Bong died in the in the pit, and uh, yeah, well, um, you had you when you were younger, you probably had an imaginary friend too, and yeah, they're dead now. Um, now the kinds of long term memory is kind of like this. You have your episodic memory. These are specific events stored in sequence. So again, like your first date, your wedding day, your favorite birthday. This is kind of like an episode of something. And you know, when you tell people about it, you describe it like a story as a narrative. Um, so again, these are your again episodic memory. These are very, very important to help you kind of keep the narrative of your life. Because again, you know, what would how would you react if you woke up one day and you like forgot all of your episodic memory, all of the events that happened to you before today? Yeah, it'd be a tad disconcerting. Then you have your semantic memory. These are your general knowledge of the world. These are your facts. Um, you know, first president of the United States. What is this? What color is this? What's a cat? What's a mouse? What's a microphone? What is... Well, you can't really see it, but, you know, this is a Star Wars mug. Um, plate. So, again, this is your... All of that is just your semantic memory. These are the things that help you, you know, j j give you the general knowledge of the world. And then you have your procedural memory. These are your skills and how to perform them. And usually these are sequential. Usually these are way too complicated to describe in words. So, like, for example, sometime try to do this. Try to describe how you walk to someone. Or how to swim. How to throw a curveball. How do you drive? Because what happens is for all of those things, you can try, you can describe some of it, but there's things that you're not going to describe. So like, for example, how do you walk? Well, you lift your leg and you take a step. Okay. How do you do that? How do you lift your leg and take a step? Because there's a lot of things that actually go into just simply taking a step. You lift your leg, you shift your weight. You fall on your leg. You have to land on your leg just the right way. You know, you have to angle your ankle the right way so your foot lands just right. Then you got to shift your weight from one leg to another leg and maintain your balance and do a bunch of other things that I probably forgot to mention right now. So this is, in essence, your muscle memory. This is all of those different things that we do, how to perform them, but they're kind of beyond our ability to describe because there's just so much going on. And again, this is again, like anything like, you know, riding a bike, walking, any of that kind of stuff falls into this category. And then you have your, uh, you know, levels of processing. Cause again, if you want to have a, uh, if you really want to store things really deep in your memory, so they don't go away. Um, uh, Pretty much you have to just deeply process it because there's kind of a shallow processing thing, just basic maintenance. And then you have your deeply processed, which is much more elaborate. So again, shallow. Okay, we'll define an opioid. Uh, that. Um, to deeply process it, you have to work with it. You have to attack it from multiple different angles. So like, for example, one thing that uh, really haven't done it this year because online but the, um, you know, when, like for vocab, you know, you can have, you know, a lot of teachers, and I've done this, define it, use it in a sentence, draw a picture. It's annoying. I know people are like, I don't want to do it. But here's the thing. If I just have you define a word, it would not stick as well than if I actually have you work with it. The more you work with something... The more you work with an idea, the more you work with a concept, the more you practice with it and ha practice it in different ways, it will more deeply ingrain that information into your memory. Like, for example, you did not immediately just start walking right away. No, you had to fall and bust your head a couple times, laying on your face. 
you had to practice over and over and over and over and over. And then, and here's something that's kind of creepy too, or kind of trippy too. When you were learning how to walk, you were still growing a lot. Like you were still a small baby. So you slept, you grew. Because when you, because you, uh, because you grow when you're asleep. You don't grow while you're awake. So you're a small child. You learn how to walk. You go to sleep. You wake up the next day. Your body is no longer the same size-wise than it was the day before. So you have to, in essence, relearn how to walk. And you do this process over and over and over and over till you're, you know, till you're about 18, 19, 20. And, um, but what happens is because you have so many memories of walking in relative un- instability because your body is always changing because you have so many memories of walking in an in, in an unstable environment because again your body is always changing you're able to take that memory and walk like in a bounce house like when you're like you're in a bouncy house and stuff like that and you have to kind of like reshift your weight a little bit, a little bit more. It's a little bit harder to walk because it's not stable. You know, it's not solid. It's, you know, it's you kind of sink into it a little bit. Because you have so many memories of falling when you're a baby, you're actually able to take that procedural memory and reapply it to when you walk in a bounce house and you're not falling over and... You still may fall over a little bit, but you're still able to kind of walk in that bounce house a little bit. But, um, but yeah, so this is, that's a very deeply processed memory. And that's something that we don't, you know, you don't really think about it because again, it's procedural memory. Usually it's, it's usually more obvious with like semantic memory. Where it's like, you know, what's who is the first president of the United States? What's two plus two? How do you add? What is addition? You know, what is, you know, what was the Magna Carta? Those types of things. Now, storage um, is kind of goes like this. A process in which information is maintained over time. How much is stored depends on how much effort we put into encoding the information and the importance of it. The things you don't care about, the things you're not going to remember. Um, the things you don't put any effort into encoding is not going to store very well. And I know there's a few people who have like an eidetic memory, photographic memory, but it's really called eidetic memory. That's, uh, that's, that's the exception to the rule. But, um, but the idea is, you know, you have these memories, you store them. How much you're able to store is direct correlation to how much effort you put into storing that information. And then your retrieval, um, when information is brought to mind from storage. So again, you have your you have things in your long term memory storage, and you can bring them out. However, you can. Now the ease of how you get those memories is also dependent on how efficiently that has been encoded. So, like for example, if you've taken a test and you didn't study for it. And then you go up and you take the test and you're just like, I don't know what this is. Or you have a really hard time remembering how to, the information so you can do the test. Well, the reason for it is that information is there on how to do that math problem or whatever. But because you did not efficiently encode that information, like by not doing your homework or something, it makes it harder for you to retrieve the information so you can solve that. So you can solve the equation that's right in front of you. So again, the more, you know, so, so the more you study, the more you can pull that information out as needed. So yeah, this is kind of the, uh, about you know how we make memories and stuff like that. So again, when it comes to memories, memories is and again, it's everything. It is the narrative of our lives. It's the information we have. 
It's the procedures and muscle memory that we know. All of these things are stored into our memory. Now, maybe stored as engrams. We're still in the process of studying that and trying to figure that out for sure. But memory is it's a complex thing. And there's a lot of things that kind of go on with it. And something else to kind of remember is when we have things like development issues, like for example, um, when we get to the psychoanalysts, one of the things that they really stress in psychoanalysis is childhood memories, childhood traumas, childhood issues, those types of things. And what happens is when it comes to certain memories, um, even if it's something we don't necessarily remember, they can those memories can still be there, just stored in another level of consciousness. So like, for example, um, you probably don't remember what life was totally like when you were five. Maybe you have like little snapshots of memory when you were five, but you really don't remember like the day-to-day -day stuff. Well, those memories may still be there, just not able to be totally retrieved because they're stored you know, deep in your unconscious. So you can have these unconscious memories be there and they still affect how you think and behave today. So a good way to think about this uh, is the uh, BIOS on your computer. In your computer, you have something that is called the BIOS. And I'm going to try to bring it up on this one real quick. Does it have it? Can I get to it? Eh, I'll try again later. Sometime to try to do that. But uh, in your computer, you have what's called the BIOS. Uh, and really, this is like a, the deep files. It's pretty much the unconscious of your computer. And what happens is within the... Within this, this controls a lot of the most basic, basic, basic hardware. Like, for example, it tells your computer fan how fast it's going to spin. Um, yeah, so there it is. What's the BIOS? Um, is the stands for basic input output software. Is a software stored on a small memory chip in the motherboard. So there's some kind of kind of what it looks like. But with here. It is, again, those things that control the most basic functioning of your computer. And these are kind of the most basic unconscious memories of your computer. That tells you, again, how fast your fan is going. Your, the most basic configuration stuff. I won't delve too much into it because, again, this isn't a computer class. This is for psychology. But, again... This is the most basic, basic stuff for that. Your unconscious, you can make the argument, which and the memories that are stored within your unconscious are kind of the basic programming that is you. And so I just bring this up because the when we do get to, you know, personality and stuff like that, we will come back to kind of what memory to memories and there are memories that you have that you're not even totally aware that you have them. That's what I'm really trying to say. You have these memories. They're there. They're influencing you. But you don't necessarily know that they're there. And I'll just leave it right there. And I will see you next time. I'm out.